Hello again and welcome to episode 17 of Signals to Danger. Thank you to everybody who's coming back every episode to listen to me tell stories of those accidents and their victims. And thank you for the likes and the shares. And thank you for the interaction that I've had on social media. If you want to be part of that conversation, just remember, look for either Daniel Fox Rail or Signals to Danger on Twitter or Signals to Danger on Facebook and Instagram. If you want to see some show notes, episode transcripts, and some extra bits of info, get yourself over to signalstodanger.com. That's also where you'll find opportunities to support the podcast, such as Patreon. I'd love to take the opportunity to thank our two new patrons since the last episode. So Ross and Joachim, welcome to Team Signals, and thank you very much for your contribution. The only thing that I will say additionally in this introduction is that it appears as though Gale force everything is blown around outside, so if you do hear a bit of noise, that's probably what that's going to be. And in what appears to be a bit of a hobby of mine, I have a little bit of a sore throat, so bear with me if I get a little bit creaky towards the end of it. I'm sure you're used to it by now. With all of that being said, time to get into episode 17. The pile of debris was a 100 yards long several tall and consisted of steel, wood, glass, fabric, a piece of carriage here, a section of bridge there. In this suburb of the capital, rescuers from all walks of life helped to dig through the wreckage to pull survivors three, but they had some work ahead of them. The pile consisted of three separate trains, and everyone arriving on the scene knew that this this was one of the bad ones. The year 1952. The place, Harrow and Wealdstone. Investigators at the scene searched through the wreckage for the injured. At least 13 people are known to have died. Carriages are crushed one on top of another. One lies metres away appears partially burned. The railway industry is tonight coming to terms with yet another disaster. This is Signals to Danger, a podcast where we look at major rail disasters which have occurred in the UK, explain what happened, how the investigation was carried out, and how each of these accidents shaped the industry going forwards. I'm Dan. I work within the rail industry in my day-to-day life, But today, I'll be the one taking you through this podcast. We start every episode by briefly revisiting the events which were taking place at the time, and this episode is no different. The year is, of course, 1952. And in the history of the UK, it's uh, fairly significant. Not least because in January, we saw our first glimpse of Sooty, a puppet beloved by generations of children as well as the first TV detective van to make sure that everybody who watched him was doing so within the realms of the law. I think to this day you could probably walk into any pub and split the room 50-50 as to whether or not people believe that those things actually do anything. The history of the nation takes a fairly substantial turn in February as God Save the King becomes God Save the Queen. George VI passes away at Sandringham and is succeeded by his 25-year-old daughter Elizabeth. At that point, starts a nearly 70-year reign, still going to this date. In May, the first jet airliner, the UK-built de Havilland Comet, takes to the skies, a symbol of British engineering prowess and potentially paving the way for a UK-led aviation production. Well, if I was making this series about plane crashes and not trains, let's just say that a Comet episode probably wouldn't be too far off. And what we ended up with was Boeings and Airbuses where de Havilland could have been. September saw 31 people killed as a prototype sea vixen, also built by de Havilland, broke up over the Farnborough air show and the debris landed on spectators, yet again proving that disasters are not just the curse of the railway. October starts with two bangs, firstly a fairly sizeable one, as the UK detonates its first atomic bomb, and two days later, the end of tea rationing. 
This had been in place for 13 years and was putting a cramp on a quintessentially English tradition. All of this brought us to the morning of the 8th of October, which as it happened, would be one of the darkest days of UK Rail. If you were to look at a map of Greater London, you would see a 1,500 square kilometer area playing the role of home to just under 9 million people. A web of roads, millions of buildings, and a swarming mass of people who live, work, visit, and pass through the nation's capital. The entire city is also crisscrossed with a network of steel rails. Above ground, commuter trains rattle into the capital from all directions bringing people in from the suburbs and surrounding towns and cities. These trains are joined below the ground by the ones on the tube. The London Underground, a tourist attraction in its own right. In addition to the commuter network in and around the city itself, this vast conurbation is the starting point for most of the country's major railway lines as well. This is a fact I'm sure will have come clear over the previous episodes. These lines spread out like arteries from the heart of the country the Great Eastern Main Line out to Norwich, the Midland Main Line up to Nottingham and Sheffield, the Great Western out to Bristol, and so on and so forth. Within the city, there are points where the main lines, commuter lines, and underground lines all coincide. The termini of the Great great Lines, the main lines, stations like King's Cross, Euston, Waterloo, Paddington, and they all see the termination of long-distance trains, local trains, and also feature an underground station. But this mix of options isn't just limited to the end of the line. As you track the main lines out from the terminus stations, you come across other locations where you find it. And one such station is the scene of this tale. The West Coast Main Line begins at London Euston. And we know it well from previous episodes, tales of Nuneaton and Greyrig. However, we're focusing a lot further south today than those episodes. 11 miles and 30 chains from the buffers in Euston, you reach these six platforms at Harrow and Wealdstone Station. This station is served by no less than four operators. Southern Railway's commuter offering between Milton Keynes and Clapham Junction, long-distance services provided by London North Western Railway, and the Watford DC line of the London Overground. They're all joined by the northern terminus of the Bakerloo line for the Underground. And all of this is before you consider the non-stop West Coast Main Line services operated by Avanti. In 2019, Harrow was the start or end of over 8 million journeys a year. Over half of them on the underground, as people make their way to jobs in the capital or out and about on their leisure travel. Because of this, platforms full of passengers are a regular sight. Or rather, they were pre-Covid, which is a a phrase we're all getting used to. Make no mistake though, 69 years ago this was already a busy station, and when the morning rush hour came around, hundreds of people flowed from the platforms at Harrow onto services into the heart of the city. The station on the morning of Wednesday the 8th of October 1952 was becoming as busy as any other, as the City of London started to awaken. We already know that the events at Harrow took place on the 8th of October, but to really tell the narrative, we actually need to wind the clock back almost 12 hours from the moment that everything went wrong. At 8.15 on the 7th, the night before, a sleeper service drew out of Perth in Scotland and started its long journey, first to Glasgow, and then it turned south and started down the West Coast Main Line to England. Travelling through the picturesque countryside of the Lake District, over T-Bay and Shap, down through the Loon Gorge towards Carlisle. Although in the dead of night, there's probably not too much to be seen, barring the glow of the fire from the cab. The 7th turned into the 8th, as the train continued southbound. 
While travelling through the north of England, the weather started to turn and fog became a slowing influence on the express. When it arrived at Crewe at around 20 past four in the morning, it was already 13 minutes late. There wasn't time to be made up here either, as unfortunately a 16 minute station duties allocation was all they had to change the locomotive and get the train set ready to depart again. The locomotive being coupled onto the front of the Perth Express here was no slouch. Number 46242, City of Glasgow, was based out of Camden Depot in London. A prime example of the coronation class, built by the London Midland and Scottish in 1940, this 161 tonne, 73 foot long, living, breathing, well, beast, it was capable of hauling heavy expresses at express speeds, really without breaking a sweat. Streamlined when it left the shop, this was one of the LMS's premier locos, instantly recognisable as one of the western cousins to the LNR's A4s, best known example of them being Mallard itself. Indeed, the Coronation class and the A4s did have a little jostling at one point for the speed record that was ultimately set by the Mallard. In the late 40s, the streamlining was removed. This decreased the weight and increased efficiency, and it was this more traditional looking version that was coupled to the front of the Perth Express at around half four in the morning. On her spacious footplate was a crew of two, the driver, R.S. Jones, and his fireman, C. Turnock. Jones had been driving trains for four and a half years, although he'd been a fireman for the 11 years prior, and other roles on the job for the 10 years before that. Both men had worked this route before and had brought the local north from the capital on a down express. When the station clock ticked to 37 minutes past four, City of Glasgow drew out of crew with Jones's hands at the control. 32 minutes late, but uh, with one of the most powerful locomotives in the country at the head of the train, there was a hope that not much more speed or time would be lost. The locomotive led 11 vehicles over the point work outside the station. A milk van, a brake van, four passenger carriages, four sleeping carriages and a final brake van. 525 tonnes of train in total, slowly building up speed as it started to head southbound. It wasn't only expresses heading out on the railway this morning. As City of Glasgow was working its way south past Stafford, Nuneaton and Rugby and the sun was rising, another train was starting its day. At 7.31 a local was just departing the town of Tring in Hertfordshire. This was a prime time commuter service. All stops to Watford, then through to Harrow and on to Euston, booked to arrive at 8.27. Exactly the right time for a short walk to the office, or a change to the tube or a bus. With 53-year-old driver A.W. Payne at the controls, supported by his fireman Hind, the train left Tring and continued south towards London. Led by 42389, a tank engine, the 332-tonne train consisted of nine compartment carriages, which were really put together for mass transportation of the morning masses, which would come in handy this morning. Due to some fairly extensive track and signalling work ongoing at Euston, some other trains have been cancelled to alleviate pressure on the infrastructure, including the one following this one. That meant that passengers were not going to be in short supply. Unfortunately, the fog was prominent in this area too, and by Watford, the local was already down by about five minutes. Understandable, considering the circumstances, but probably of some frustration to the hundreds starting to fill the 74 compartments of the train. 11 miles to the south of Harrow Station was yet another train that we must concern ourselves with. The 8am departure from Euston was not a local train, nor was it hauled merely by a tank engine. The Liverpool Express was to run north at speed, delivering passengers to the port city without delay, 17 vehicles long, 11 of them passenger carriages, both third and first class. In addition, there were four brake vans on the train to provide additional luggage space. But neither of these were the impressive thing about this train. That came at the front. The Liverpool Express was hauled by not one express passenger locomotive, but two. Heading up the train was number 45637, 
Windward Isles. 133 tonnes in weight, this LMS Jubilee class steamer was one of the workhorses of the West Coast, and it wasn't alone on this journey. Behind her was 46202, Princess Anne. Princess Anne had started life as the Turbo Motive, an experimental loco which replaced the pistons with turbines, although in 1949 the turbine had failed, and a post-war Britain didn't really have the pennies to replace it, or rather it was considered uneconomical in the environment of austerity. In 1952, two months before this date, a rebuild of the turbo motive had led to the creation of Princess Anne, a far more conventional Princess Royal class, 159 tonnes heavy and 74 feet long, and sitting second in the lineup of this Down Express. The Liverpool train tipped the scales at an incredible 737 tonnes, and 293 of them were at the very head of the train in the form of those two locomotives. At five past eight, five minutes late, every one of them started to steam out of Euston's platforms on the way north. Three separate trains on three separate journeys. One approaching its end, one just starting out, and well, one everyday commute in full swing, all making their way up and down the West Coast main line, all slowly heading towards Harrow and Wealdstone. As the local train approached Harrow from the north, it traversed a crossover from the up slow to the up fast line. This directed it into platform four, full of passengers waiting to board the train for the journey into the city. Many of them were railway employees themselves off to work in the Midland region offices close to Euston Station, taking full advantage of the service that BR operated to get them into work. As I said earlier, the next train was cancelled, so plenty were waiting for them on their arrival. Payne expertly brought the engine to a halt at the far end of the platform, his nine carriages just accommodated. Almost immediately, the compartment doors were opened and people flooded onto the train's carriages. The guard, Mr Merritt, had been travelling in the brake compartment, in the third coach from the rear of the train. With such a busy platform, he walked forwards a little along it and even directed passengers to board in the brake compartment. Both Payne and Hind on the footplate were conscious of the fact that they had been stood a little longer than normal, but they chalked it down to the heavy loadings. By the time they had been stood for a minute or so, it was estimated that there were around 800 people in the 74 compartments of the local train. Next stop, Euston. The brakes of the train were released, anticipating the guard's signal and the departure of the service. Merritt started to walk back toward the two carriages behind his brake compartment. He needed to close the doors and make sure they were shut properly. And that? Well, that's when he heard something that filled him with dread. From the fog to the north, he heard the Perth Express approaching, at speed. As soon as he saw it burst out of the fog, he took cover under the coping stones of the down platform to the opposite side of the island. This quite possibly saved his life, as Britain's worst ever peacetime rail disaster started to take place. At somewhere between 50 and 60 miles an hour, the leading buffer beam of the city of Glasgow slammed into the drawbar of the last coach of the local service. The 525 tonne sleeper played the part of the unstoppable force, the local and almost immovable object. Because the brakes had been released, the local train was actually pushed forwards, but only about 20 yards, and this didn't even remotely come close to absorbing the energy of the sleeper train. This was taken care of by the timber construction of bodies of the rearmost two carriages of the local train. 
The underframe of the ninth was thrust up and over that of the eighth, and in turn under that of the seventh. All three carriages were compressed into a space the length of one of them, and their underframes were pushed up onto the platform to the left of the train. By some miracle, however, the other six carriages of the train were pushed forwards and for the most part were undamaged. But this sudden collision hadn't just devastated the rear of the local train, and as the locomotive of the Perth Express had come to a sudden stop, the tender had slewed around to the left, riding up against the frame of the cab and severely damaging the footplate area. It ended up to the side of the wreckage of the local train, on the down fast line just underneath the station footbridge. Behind it, the first, second, third, fourth and fifth vehicles were piled up behind and above the locomotive, and the distorted underframes and bogies, together with some of the bogies of the local train, were compressed into a mass of wreckage, about 100 feet long, covering the down and up fast lines between the platforms. This pile would have been difficult to unpick, and to attribute the origin of each piece of the wreckage would have been nigh on impossible, the bodies of the two leading vans of the sleeper were of timber construction and rapidly became splinters as they rammed up against the tender of the locomotive. The following three were dealt with equally as forcefully and saw comprehensive damage as each slammed into the wreckage of the one before. Further back than the sixth carriage of the sleeper though, damage became minor and superficial. Fixtures and fittings, not critical components. And had everything stopped at that time, this would probably have been one of the worst accidents that the country had ever seen. The forces involved, two busy trains, the time of the accident. It certainly would have been memorable. But a third part of the jigsaw fell into place almost immediately after the city of Glasgow collided with the rear of the local train. 737 tonnes of the Liverpool Express. The leading locomotive of the Liverpool train, Windward Isles, travelling at 60 miles an hour, collided with the city of Glasgow underneath the footbridge. She was diverted left and up, starting a terrifying journey over the island platform, separating the down fast and the up electric lines. Eventually coming to rest lying on her left hand side on the up electric. Princess Anne, the second locomotive, was dragged along the platform at the same time also ending up on her side at the very edge of the up-platform. In total, nearly 300 tonnes of loco had smashed their way across a passenger platform, and that's without even considering the carriages behind it. The force of the collision had severely damaged both engines, but Windward Isles to an entirely different level. Except for her boiler, she was practically reduced to scrap. The bogey was wrecked and its component parts scattered. The buffer beam and the frames were folded back as far as the leading coupled wheels. There was also heavy damage at the rear end as the tender was driven into it. The report features a photograph of the locomotive and you can't help but wonder, where's the rest of it? The leading brake van followed the locos onto the platform, but its right hand side was ripped out by the underframe of the next carriage, the body of which was destroyed. The third vehicle also ended up here on the platform between the down fast and the up electric, but the fourth took a different path altogether. As this one piled into the wreckage of all of the others, it was diverted to the right instead, up and over the wreckage of the local and the sleeper. The greater part of its roof at the rear was torn away and left behind as it was forced up against the footbridge girders, and the brake and luggage compartments were wrecked. The carriage eventually came to a stand on the up-fast platform. The fifth vehicle had its steel body crushed and lay next to the footbridge, but the next two, the sixth and seventh carriages of the Liverpool train, ran straight ahead, over the wreckage rapidly piling up on the upline, coming to rest on top of it, the momentum of the impact carrying them over. One of the vehicles, it's impossible to say which, which ran under the footbridge, latched onto and pulled away one of the girders, ridding the bridge of some quite substantial components. 
The eighth vehicle of the Liverpool Express contacted the rest of this wreckage next, but it was the last vehicle to do so. It was wedged under the footbridge, with its leading end resting on a heap of five or six bogies and other debris, but its trailing bogey was somehow still on the rails. The last seven vehicles of Liverpool train came to a stand in the platform of the downfast, undamaged. Especially one compared to the rest of the train. Finally, all three trains had come to a complete halt. Steam vented from destroyed boilers and wreckage began to settle. The time of the impact had been recorded for all to see, as the forces involved were so great that it stopped the station clock. 8.19am. The echoes of the impact began to fade and they were replaced with the moans and cries for help. These three trains had suddenly and violently come to share one section of track, and now the task of rescue and recovery needed to begin. Immediately following the accident, telephone calls were made by station staff, suddenly confronted with the horrifying sight which now covered half of the station's platforms. The central location of the station in the town of Harrow meant that the emergency services were not far away, and the first ambulance arrived within three minutes of the accident. The numbers of ambulance men, doctors and fire crews only increased as time ticked on. Railway men, who had already started swarming over the wreckage, were quickly joined by the professionals, including a medical unit from a nearby US airbase. The first loaded ambulance left the site at 8.27am, and from that point forwards there was a continuous stream of them heading to nearby hospitals up until 10.30am, and by 12.15, the great majority of the injured had received first aid attention and had been conveyed to hospital. Two further seriously injured cases were removed at 2.30pm, but it was not until 1.30am on the following morning that there appeared to be no chance at all of anybody else being found alive in the debris of the coaches. 157 people were transferred to hospitals once they were rescued from the piles of debris which covered the fast, slow and electric lines at Harrow. 84 of them were detained, with many of them seeing very serious injuries. In total, 340 people had been injured once the tally was completed. But it should come as no surprise that those were not the only people who fell victim to this disaster. The driver and fireman of the Perth Express, Jones and Turnock, and the driver of the leading Liverpool engine all lost their lives. Unfortunately, they were joined by seven passengers who had already been travelling in the Liverpool train, 23 from the Perth train, and 64 from the local train. Additionally, there were 14 other deaths who couldn't be attributed to any of the trains. But the horrifying truth is that it was probable that some passengers who were waiting on the island platform between the down fast and up electric lines were caught by the derailed engines of the Liverpool train. No less than 36 of the passengers who were killed and many of the injured were members of the railway staff who were travelling to work in London. For them, this was just a normal commute to the offices. For so many of those who lost their lives, this was just a normal journey. For only the second time in the history of railways in this country, a death toll measured in three figures was returned by the accident at Harrow and Wealdstone. That number? 112 lives lost.
The death toll of 112 puts Harrow and Wheelston in a firm second place for the deadliest train crashes in the UK. Second only to Quinton's Hill's 226. There were a number of differences between these two, and we will do an episode on Quinton's Hill at some point. We do need to cover it. One notable difference, however, was that Quinton's Hill took place in 1915, during the Second World War. The railway was stretched to help fill the war effort, and indeed one of the trains involved was a troop train, taking soldiers from Scotland to Liverpool to ship out. Harrow and Wheelston took place under a normal timetable, without the additional stresses of war traffic, so how had a disaster on this scale taken place? That was the question that the investigators needed to answer, but to achieve this they needed to break it down into several other questions. Firstly, what had led to the Perth train colliding with the rear of the local? What protections had been in place to keep those two trains separate, and how had they failed? Secondly, what the first collision had taken place, was there any manner in which the second, the one involving the Liverpool, could have been avoided? Then had the differing construction of the coaches contributed in any way to the survivability of the crash? One other point that was worth consideration was whether or not technology existed elsewhere that could have prevented or reduced the severity of the accident. To best understand the reasons that these two trains had ended up on the very same section of track, we need to look at the way the railway was being worked at this time. It's also worth bearing in mind that there was nothing wrong with the route of the Liverpool train. And had the downline not been fouled by wreckage, it would have steamed through Harrow at speed and continued north without incident. With regards to the local and the sleeper, however, it was clear that they were both on the up-fast line the line that ran through Platform 4 at Harrow, and that they were there at the same time. This is very much against the basic principle of signalling, one train in one section at one time. So what had gone wrong? Harrow and Wheelston Station has six lines which run through it. The up and down electric, the up and down fast, and the up and down slow. Which lines trains travelled on depended on the journeys they were making. Express trains with minimal stops were routed onto the fast lines. Stopping or goods trains were routed via the slow, and the electric lines played host to the DC electric multiple units. The Perth Express was very easy to categorise. It was an express service, travelling long distances and not calling at local stations. Due to this fact, it had run on the fast lines wherever they were present. It was path to pass through the up-fast platform at Harrow, and continue on the line past Wembley and down to Euston so there was no question as to whether or not it was meant to be there. How about the local train? This was a regularly stopping passenger train from the outskirts of the capital, and it had called at all stations before reaching Harrow. So you would imagine it was to run through the station on the slow line, especially since it was stopping there and other services wouldn't be. It's not quite the case, though. Up until Harrow, the local service had run on the slow lines, stopping at each station. But on its approach to Harrow, it was planned to cross over from the up slow to the up fast. It was booked to stop in platform 4 at the station. It's not a decision that was made on the day, this was the plan. And there was a reason for this. I appreciate it might seem a little unnecessary, but from Harrow, the local train was non-stop into Euston, and unlikely to cause any other delays or conflicts with other traffic. Running it via the fast lines also left the slow lines free for other movements, specifically in this case empty stock movements from Wilsdon Depot. As an interesting aside, any booked move where passenger trains are running without being in passenger service are known as ECS moves, or empty coaching stock, even when they're multiple units, not coaches per se. Their head codes also start with a number 5 under the conventions that we currently use, but I am getting a little bit tangential there. The important thing is that we understand that the local train was booked to be transferred to the fast lines at Harrow. It had just as much of a right to be there as the Express did. 
so we know that they were both booked to be there. It was clear, however, that they weren't supposed to be there at the same time. Next steps to understand what was in place to separate them. A very basic answer was timetables. Both trains couldn't pass through the same section of track at the same time, so the timetable wasn't written that way. Even now, in theory, you can pick a section of rail and through the magic of timetables, see exactly what trains are meant to be on it, at what time and in what order. This is probably true even of some of the most complex pieces of track outside some of the largest terminus stations, and that's not to say things don't change on the day. I think the railway is built on flexibility, but generally there's a rule that you can sort of follow that convention, know what's meant to be there. Because of the fact that they couldn't be there at the same time, the timetable was planned so that these trains were going to pass at different times. The Perth Express had been due to pass through Harrow at around 7am, and the local at around 8.15, which is an incredibly decent sized gap of 75 minutes. Very, very nicely separated from each other, but that only works if the rest of the world plays along. We know already weather did not play ball on the morning of the 8th. The local service left Tring on time, but fog slowed it down somewhat. By the time it left Watford, it was five minutes late, progress slowed down by the weather, and that meant that it arrived into Harrow a little after 8.15, crossing over from the slow lines into the fast. The problem here was that the express was also affected by weather, and delayed. 13 minutes late arriving at Crewe, 32 minutes late leaving there. It then ran southbound to Watford, where it was slowed at the tunnel by a 15 mile an hour speed restriction. Well, rather it was slowed waiting for another train to transit the tunnel at that speed, and then slowed even further to make that journey itself. All things told, by the time the sleeper reached Harrow, it was about 80 minutes late. This is what put it in platform 4 at 8.19 in the morning, at the exact same time as the sleeper service. In the early days of the railway, a lot of the separation relied on this method, but I'm sure you can see the problem. Whether disruptive passengers, engineering issues, and an ever-lengthening list of potential issues means that relying solely on timetables would be nigh on impossible, if not patently stupid. Which is why we don't do it anymore, we blatantly don't rely on this now, and actually this certainly didn't in 1952. Delays brought the trains to the same place at the same time, but there were measures in place which should have meant that they did not physically try to share the same piece of track. Trains are signalled. They are provided signals from the line side, which instruct them whether or not they can proceed along, whether or not they need to take caution and be prepared to stop amongst a multitude of other things. This is the case almost everywhere now, and it is the case outside Harrow in 1952. The method of signalling then was absolute block. We have covered absolute block before, um, so I will give you a very pared down version. Each signal box is responsible for a section of track. They offered trains by the next box down the line, and they can only accept them if their section is clear. They then offer their train onto the next section, and so on and so forth. To look after their sections, signal boxes are provided with signals, although this will probably come as no surprise to you. A bog standard absolute block system typically features a distant signal, a home signal, and a starter. Starter signals and home signals can only show clear or danger, and the distance can only show clear or caution. If either the home or starter signals are at danger, the distance must be at caution. This way a driver who sees the caution knows to slow down and be prepared to stop at the home signal. This section of the West Coast Main Line was controlled under absolute block, specifically from the Harrow number no. 1 box. This box was responsible for the signals on the up and down fast and slow lines, and the signals that controlled them. Speaking of signals, a train approaching Harrow Platform 4 on the up fast line would see the following sequence. 2,100 yards before the start of the platform was the up fast distant, a colour light signal which showed yellow for caution or green for proceed. 1,400 yards further along the track was a semaphore signal, the up fast outer home, followed 450 yards later by the up fast inner home. 
directly before the crossover from the slow to the fast lines. Once the train passed through the platform, there was the up-fast starter and the up-fast advanced starter controlling trains leaving the platform and handing them off to North Wembley Box. As you can see, that is quite an advancement from the bog standard setup that I've just described, especially when you consider that this is multiplied over two sets of up and down lines. All of this means that we now need to ask a very important question. Had the signals been set correctly? With the local train in platform 4, the signals should have been set to protect it. Because the local had crossed over from the slow to the fast line at Harrow, the Perth Express should have steamed on towards the town and seen a caution aspect at the distant and slowed in preparation to stop at the outer home. It's clear it didn't. Nor did it stop at the inner home. So were the signals set correctly? To clarify this most important of questions, the investigators started down a couple of lines of inquiry, and arguably the most important was talking to the signalman responsible for Harrow Number 1 box that morning, a Mr Armitage. He told investigators how he had run trains through this section that morning. He'd been working since 6am, covering the box as a relief signaller. And around half past six, he had instigated fog working. This knowledge was important, Weather, visibility and what part they played were a really big consideration for this accident. We know that fog was a big part in how the trains were brought together. Did it play a part in the signals not being seen? Under fog working, trains must be kept two sections apart. And of course this means that less trains can run, especially in busy areas where it's not unfeasible that every consecutive section for a length of track could be occupied. It does, however, mitigate the risks of a signal passed at danger. Signalmen will implement fog working when visibility means that they are unable to see their fog object. At Harrow number one box, the fog object was the up slow home signal. And at ten past eight in the morning, Armitage decided that he could see that signal and away past them. The fog had thinned. In that case, nine minutes before the collision took place, he telephoned his control and sent the message, fog off. This meant that the visibility had improved and he was stopping the fog working. Just prior to the point he made this call, Armitage had been offered two trains, a delayed express from Glasgow on the up fast and the local train on the up slow at seven minutes past. He accepted both into his section as both his fast and slow lines were clear. Two minutes later, he received a signal to tell him that the Glasgow Express was entering his section, and at 11 minutes past 8 it steamed in on the up fast, past his box and through platform 4. Chillingly, Armitage recalls in this part of his testimony that the platform looked quite a bit busier than usual. Around the same time, two other things happened. He received a signal to tell him that the local train was approaching, and then he was offered the Perth Express from the next box north. A lot happened very quickly after this point, and this isn't that unusual because this was a very busy section of line, but it all happened very quickly, and some of the things that happened were very bad. At some point here, but he couldn't recall exactly when, Armitage set the crossover for the local train to cross from the up slow to the up fast. This was a conscious decision that had been made because the local train was going to take precedence over the sleeper bearing down on the station despite the fact the local was stopping here. Now this might seem counterintuitive and sort of goes against our instinctive feeling that expresses should probably be given priority, but there was nothing wrong with this decision. In fact, Armitage did exactly the right thing. Local instructions were given to provide priority to local trains in this area, instead of late running expresses from the north. And it makes sense really. Firstly, this local train was now running straight through to Euston, as was the express. But the express was 80 minutes late already. This local train would have additional workings throughout the morning and to delay that would have a greater effect on the timetable as a whole. So Armitage reversed the crossover to allow the local train to access the up fast, expecting to hold the sleeper at his outer home which was set to danger. With that outer home set to danger, the distance on the up fast showed a caution, so 2,000 yards back along the track Driver Jones would see a yellow light, 
brake his train and hold it at the signals outside the station. At 8.14 Armitage received a train entering section for the local train and offered it forwards to Wembley. He cleared the home signal on the slow line to allow the local train to approach the crossover and enter the upfast platform. This move protected by the up home signals. And he also cleared the starting signals on the up fast to allow the local train to leave the platform. After the local passed the up slow signals, he put them back to danger and recorded that the local arrived at the platform at 8.17. Exactly in line with the time that he received a signal to tell him that the Perth Express, with City of Glasgow pulling hard at the head, was leaving the last section and entering his. Armitage told how a minute or so later he was astonished to hear the sound of the Perth Express approaching at speed, and he said that when he first saw it, it was coming out of the mist and passing my outer home signal on the upfast. Now this signal is nearly 600 yards from the box, so it does tell us that visibility had improved somewhat. <sighs> Armitage saw that it was making no attempt to stop. So he took some swift action to try and stop the disaster that he already knew was certain. He threw a lever, which automatically placed three detonators on the fast line. And these were found later to have exploded, but clearly didn't have much of an impact. And he also knew at this stage that the last thing he needed was another train entering the area. So he threw back the signal against the Liverpool Express, which he knew was very much on its way. When he did so, he heard the buzzer, which warned him that the Liverpool was already occupying the track circuit he was trying to protect. Armitage recalled that the two impacts happened almost at the same time. He recorded the time in his logbook and sent the signal to boxes either side. Obstruction. Danger. Those who spoke to Armitage immediately afterwards said that he was shaken. In fact, the station master at Harrow went up to the box around 10 minutes after the collision. He found Armitage to be deathly white and very upset, and he helped him out of the box to sit on the steps to get some air. Although Armitage was clearly horrified by what he saw, his account was clear. He carried out his role as he saw fit and to the rules of the position that he held. Unfortunately, a contrasting account could not be obtained from the footplate crew of the Perth sleeper, and neither survived the accident. Without their version of events, and about 50 years too soon for forward-facing CCTV, it was up to the instruments themselves to either prove or disprove Armitage's account. Within minutes of the accident taking place, signalling engineers who had been travelling on the local train had been up to the box and recorded the position of the levers, and before half an hour had elapsed, a lineman had been sent to go and see what the signal lights were showing on the distance. About an hour later, a telegraph inspector arrived, and he checked the aspects of each signal displayed, the repeaters in the box and the equipment within the box. All of these reviews were unanimous. The signals were showing as Armitage said they would have been, which led the investigation to come to the conclusion that no blame could be laid at his feet which unfortunately meant that the report concluded that the first collision resulted when driver R.S. Jones did not reduce the speed of the Perth train in obedience to the Harrow No. 1 up fast distance signal at caution and subsequently passed the outer and inner homes at danger. The, re the problem with this conclusion was best worded by the report itself. Owing to the very regrettable death of the two men on the footplate, it is only possible to speculate on the circumstances of the human failure which brought about the first collision. Driver Jones was an engineman of considerable experience and mature age with a good record, and it appeared that he had been driving in proper caution during the journey from Crewe in the fog. The investigation yet again turned towards visibility. The harrow up distance are only 1,300 yards beyond the hatch end box, which Jones will have known that he passed. But by all accounts, the visibility of these signals was not nearly so good as it was at hatch end. It might have been 100 yards or less, and at 50 mile an hour, they would have been in the driver's view for about 4 seconds only. 
I'll admit this is not a long time, but the colour lights are well sighted and they're focused for observation from the left-hand side of an engine and two other drivers who were travelling at very much the same speed had had no difficulty seeing them a few minutes earlier. There was a question as to whether or not a train which had passed shortly before may have left a pall of smoke in the vicinity of a bridge, just nearby the signals, but as the report says again, such happenings are in the ordinary run of a driver's experience, and if Jones had been keeping the close and continuous lookout which the conditions required, he could hardly have missed an intense colour light which is so conspicuous at short range and presented so close to his line of sight. When the report was published, investigators could only suggest that Jones may have relaxed his concentration on the signals for some unexplained reason, which may have been quite trivial. At any rate, during the few seconds for which the distant signal could be seen from the engine, he didn't see them. Having thus missed the distant he may have continued forwards, still expecting to see the colour light and not the Harrow semaphore stop signals, which were at a considerably higher elevation. He may have suddenly realised that he had missed the distant when the signal box and the surroundings of Harrow Station came into view. Without the ability to talk to Jones, or to see what he saw, we can't really answer this question any more fully than that. But this was our reason the root cause for the first collision. Jones did not stop his train in response to the signals that had been meant to protect the local service. Unfortunately, we've kind of already answered our second question. Could the second collision have been prevented? Under the setup of the signals here in northwest London, there was no way that Armitage could have known that the Perth sleeper had blown through the distant signals until he saw it, and by that point there was no chance of stopping that first collision. Or the second. The Liverpool Express was already in the section, and passed any signals which could have slowed or stopped it. Even if fancy automated signals or warning systems had been in place, the only point at which Liverpool was in any danger was after the collision, when the wreckage of the other crash had strayed into its path. And even if we transported this 60 or 70 years into the future, and added a GSMR radio into the cabs, and Armitage had been able to send a railway emergency call, a stop message to all trains in the area, it probably wouldn't have made a difference. The time between the two collisions was so short that I don't believe there would have been any opportunity for making any meaningful braking. It just wouldn't have taken effect quickly enough. Bear in mind that at one point in the report, it states that it couldn't be guaranteed whether or not the Perth engine had completely come to a stand on the downline before it was struck by the engines and the Liverpool service. It really was one and then another. I don't believe that there was anything that could have been done to prevent the second collision taking place after the first one had already happened. With regards to the question about the survivability of the coaches, we have talked about this in previous accidents, and here at Harrow the question was quite prominent. This accident took place at a point where some changes were being made in the construction of carriages on the network, and the changes can be seen in the mixture of coaches involved. There were a number of vehicles here with an all timber body, such as the leading two vans of the Perth Express, or the rear two vehicles of the local train. The majority of vehicles here, however, were vehicles with steel panels, but timber framing, a bit of a middle ground, but very, very standard for the era. And the last type involved was only found on Liverpool service, an all-steel construction, 
Steel panels yet again, but with steel frames, and it was all welded together. As I have said in the past, although we're comparing the performance of different types, it really is worth bearing in mind the scale of the accident here at Harrow. As it says in the report, an exceptional disaster such as this, in which enormous destructive forces were applied to a large number of vehicles from different directions, can give no firm grounds for conclusions on the merits of different types of carriage construction, not from a safety point of view. I think, however, it is fair to say that the comparatively modern composite coach body with short steel panels and roof and hardwood framing is not in itself a great deal stronger in structural resistance to collision forces than the older all-timber constructions. The heavy steel underframes, which have been adopted for all mainline stock in recent years, can sometimes give considerable protection against the crushing of a vehicle as a whole, but if overriding takes place, their resistance is not brought into full play, and in those circumstances a heavy underframe may even add to the destruction by the well-known telescoping effect. This is something that we've seen before. The relative looseness of the chain and link coupling mean that a greater amount of vertical movement is available, and during collisions, that can allow for coaches to ride over each other. And all you need is for the heavy steel underframe of one to get above that of the other, if the body construction is all timber. And that's where you get some really, really nasty telescoping. There were some carriages, like I said, here in the Liverpool train that were an all steel body shell mounted on the normal underframe. And the report goes on to say that those are an improvement and has proved its value more than once in collisions where the conditions were less severe. We know that some coaches of the Liverpool train were of the all-steel construction, but one of them, Coach 5, was fairly comprehensively destroyed. The report accounts for this. No carriage body for service in this country can be built, even in steel, to withstand the very violent shocks which must have been received by the fifth coach of the Liverpool train. And we have seen this to some extent. These are carriages that were being built in 1952, and we've seen accidents with coaching stock that was built in the 70s and 80s, where they can be as strong as you like, but the specific forces involved in those specific accidents destroyed them almost comprehensively. Just look at some of the photographs from Great Heck, or from the carriage at South Hall that ended up being bent in half. Good design crashworthiness and survivability will only take you so far. One other point that was raised around the coaching stock in the report was not specifically the construction of them, but actually the way that those were marshalled or laid out in the train. A prime example is the Perth train. The leading two vehicles were the milk van and the brake van. And the report says that the presence of those two bogey vans at the front of the train undoubtedly saved serious damage to the passenger coach marshalled 6th and to the following sleeping car. The Perth train, the leading end of the Perth train, suffered some horrific damage. But if two of those vehicles had been passenger carriages instead of vans, you could be looking at a number higher than 112 quite easily. The industry already recognised the value of this protection and instructions had been issued to all regions in 1948 that a brake van or a vehicle with a brake compartment at the leading or trailing end should be marshalled at the front or rear of passenger trains wherever practicable. It just offered a little bit more protection to the bits where the people were sitting. One of the biggest parts of any investigation, which will have become abundantly obvious in past episodes, is how best the industry can prevent reoccurrences. Harrow was horrific. Only the second time in our railway's history that a death toll ran to triple digits. Preventing a third was incredibly high on British Rail's agenda, as well as that of the Railway Inspectorate, and the nation on a whole. To work towards preventing a third accident of this scale, Part of the report included recommendations. Recommendations have always been a part of these reports, and they still are. Every REIB report today has a recommendation section, and you'll have seen that in 
some of the episodes that we've done or in some of the updates that I've done outside of this. There could be a suggestion to retrain staff on a particular issue or to redesign a process or a practice. There could be that the infrastructure operator needs to develop a system of work or revise maintenance regimes. You, you get the idea. The strongest recommendation by far from the report into Harrow and Wheelston actually revolved around a safety feature that could have prevented the accident. The technology? Automatic train control. As the report said, the way to guard against the exceptional case of human failure in the kind which occurred at Harrow does not lie in making the regulations more restrictive with the consequent adverse effect on traffic movement, but in reinforcing the vigilance of drivers by apparatus which provides a positive link between the wayside signals and the footplate. Well, we have this technology now, a system which reacts in this way and sends signals to drivers based on what the signals say. AWS, the automatic warning system. Back in October last year, I released a bonus episode which covered AWS, going into the history a bit. Please feel free to go back now and have a listen, but I will briefly run through some of the facts now. The system works like this. Before each signal, there is a piece of equipment between the running rails called the AWS ramp. The ramps consist of at least a few components, a slope piece of metal, a permanent magnet, which is constantly magnetised, and an electromagnet, which can be turned on and off. As the train passes over the permanent magnet, the system is set. As it continues over the electromagnet, it's reset. The electromagnet is only energised if the attached signal is showing a proceed aspect, and when the system's reset, it'll make a bell sound in the cab. If the signal's not clear, showing a caution or a danger aspect, the electromagnet will not be energised, and this means that when the train passes over the permanent magnet, the system's set, but it isn't reset. At that point, a warning horn sounds in the cab, and the driver has about 2.75 seconds to uh, acknowledge it by pressing a button, and if he doesn't, the train's brakes are automatically applied in a full emergency setting, and the train will be brought to a stand. This is thing that is really of relevance in relation to this disaster. That when Jones blew through the distant at yellow, he would have received a horn warning him of the adverse aspect, and it would have given him ample time to slow the express for the horn signals, or if he'd been incapacitated or anything like that, the train would have been brought to a stand automatically. What a shame that this system wasn't available at the time. Except if you've listened to that bonus episode, you'll kind of know that it was. AWS first appeared in the form of automatic train control, installed by GWR and fitted along its routes in the south of the country. This earlier system was reliant on physical contact between track and train, and not magnets, and it was found from as early as 1906. A physical ramp would make contact with a shoe underneath the locomotive at distant signals, fulfilling the same purpose as the magnets I've just mentioned. There's a few little things that are different in the way it worked, but that's the general principle. This fact was not lost on the investigators, and virtually two and a half pages of this report tell the story of the history of automatic train control, pointing out that the Great Western Railway had 1,300 route miles covered by the system. It also makes reference to trials with a system known as the HUD system, an adaptation of the system using magnets that was being tried in a few other areas around the south of London. The report detailed the progress being made on this technology. After some small-scale comparative trials early in 1948 and discussions with the inspecting officers, the railway executive put forward tentative proposals for a programme to extend warning control on mainline routes. They considered that it should be initiated as soon as circumstances would allow, and envisaged an expenditure of some £6 million staged over six years. Now credit where it's due, this was no small proposed expenditure. The £6 million they're talking about here is closer to £173 million today. BR continued trials on the system trying to perfect it over the next couple of years, and by August 1952, a final design had been put together, planned to be fitted to the first locomotive on the 17th of October. Nine days before this installation, a passenger express passed a signal at danger and led to the loss 
of 112 lives at Harrow and Wheelston Station. The tragedy at Harrow and Wheelston led to a real surge in the implementation of automatic terrain control, and the new system, dubbed AWS, was finally approved by the Ministry of Transport in 1956. From that point, installation increased and spread out further and further. Distant signals in absolute block areas were fitted with them, and when colour light signals were introduced, they were fitted there too. We know as an industry that AWS has gone a long way to saving lives and there are many instances that could have become training opportunities or near misses that could have so easily become episodes for this podcast. The idea was taken further in the 90s with Train Protection and Warning System, TPWS, which I've talked about past again. That can automatically apply the brakes based on the speed a train approaches buffer stops, signals or even just operate as an overspeed sensor anywhere on the network. And yes, in an ideal world, it would be great to just trust humans to never make mistakes, but sadly, we just know that's not the case. Mistakes happen. We're only human. So it's important to have these safety nets. Nobody wants to see another harrow. The sheer number of lives lost at Harrow is what makes this such a significant disaster. 112 people. It's difficult to imagine, isn't it? I, for one, can say I never want to open a newspaper and read double figures from a train crash again. However, I don't know that we'll always be that lucky. Carmont took the lives of three last year. But in a world where passenger numbers were down around 90%, I dread to think what that number might have been in a normal year. We can put all the protections in place, the best rolling stock, and sometimes the forces involved can just surmount all of that. If we were to duplicate the circumstances at Harrow with modern stock, I certainly don't know that we'd be lucky enough to come away with a single digit toll. The terrible October morning in 1952 was commemorated with a memorial, The north entry to the station was adorned with a stone plaque, unveiled 50 years after the accident in 2002. Which does seem like quite a bit of time, but it really makes sense to remember it in this way. It was also commemorated as part of a mural adorning the wall alongside the station, dedicating the mural to the memories of those who lost lives and in gratitude to those who saved them. These memorials allow for a moment of reflection for the millions of people who enter the station each year, starting a daily commute into the city, a normal, everyday journey, in exactly the same way as so many others did 70 years ago. Thank you so much for tuning into episode 17. I'm glad you made it to the end. I know I almost didn't. Once again, please like, share, review, come interact on social media. And if you do want to support the podcast, get yourself over to signalstodanger.com and look at either the support or the shop pages. Until the next episode, travel safe.